Hey, good morning, everybody. We're going to be doing another presentation through our journey throughout systematic theology. Um, last week, we examined the divine, the divine decree or the decrees of God. Uh, we talked about how God is the first cause of his decrees, but how he also uses a second cause uh, of his decrees. How there is no sin, though God is not the author of sin. He decrees all things to come to pass come to pass and that presentation is already on my youtube channel um now this week is going to be we're moving out of theology proper for a time being today we're going to be talking about soteriology and ordo salutis soteriology is the doctrine of the study of salvation or how one becomes saved the word soteriology comes from the greek word soter meaning deliverer or savior. What do we need to be delivered from or saved from? Well, we need to be saved from our sin, obviously. Now, the beginning of this presentation is going to be very basic knowledge to a majority of Christians. Then later, we're going to get more technical uh, regarding some other words uh, regarding monergism, synergism, and ordo salutis. We need to be saved from transgressing God's law. The fact is we've all broken his law. I have broken all 10 commandments and so have you. We need to be saved from the wrath of God. We need to be saved from being a slave to sin. We need to be saved from the power of death. Now, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, 1 John 3.4 Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Romans 3, 9 through 10, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. Many years ago, many years ago, probably about 15 years ago while preaching at a church, um, I made a comment that Dennis Preger was going to hell without salvation. That if Dennis Preger uh, was not the elect that um he would be going he would he would he would perish in hell you must be born again the scripture says and a man by the name of bob bob well his last initial is s is in sam but bob s or robert s was so angry with me that it's per it, it, that he left it actually severed our relationship and bob bob went his own way and uh, evidently, I stepped on his idol. Uh, evidently, he was a huge Dennis Preger fan. But you know what? We only want to be a fan of one man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Um, so I don't know what happened to Bob. Uh, who knows? But um, the, the the elect will be a diverse populace of people. That's That's whom his chosen people will be. They will be male, female, slave, free. Uh, masters, slaves, they will be Jews and Gentiles. It's going to be uh, a diverse populace of in, in God's elect and in, in, in the church. Now, the next verse, uh, it was Romans 6.23, repent before it's payday, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Regarding being a slave to sin, the elect are saved from slavery to slavery. Uh, that, that's a good thing to be a slave to God. The elect are slave from being a slave to sin to a slave to God in Christ. On my personal Facebook profile, uh, you'll see my name, Bill Retz, and in the parentheses next to it is the Greek word doulos. That uh, means bond slave. But what are we a slave to? You're either a slave to your sin or you're a slave to God and Christ. Doulos, a bond slave. That's what we're saved from, from, a, from, from slavery into the, in sin to slavery in God and Christ. Romans 6, 20 through 22. For when you were slaves of sin, past tense, you were free in regard to righteousness. But 
my little Emily behind me is bark. Emily, don't bark. I'm trying to make a very important presentation. But what fruit were you getting at the Emily? Emily, sweetie, little girl. It's okay, baby girl. Hang on, let me get Emily. Here, Emily. Here. Like came here with four chihuahuas. Look at her. Me. Emmy. Emmy. <laughs> She's my little Emmy. She's my little Emmy. Okay. All right, you be quiet. Quit barking. All right. Little Emily. Found my wife found her in a cardboard box uh when it was twenty-three degrees out or twenty-eight degrees out uh, in SoCal. Man, 11 years ago, I think, 10 years ago. Yeah, with a little sign that said, free take one. And there was one in the box. She was about big. All right, and that's Dixie from Dixieland. She's growling because Emily's trying to get on, on onto the pillow that she's sleeping on. All right, Romans 6. Very professional studio here, folks. Romans 6, 20 through 23. When we were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But the fruit, hey, Dixie, no. I'm mean, aren't I? But what fruit were you getting at the time of the things which you were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. Man, it is so awesome by the grace of God to be set free. He set the captives free from being a slave to our sin to a slave to him. Amen. Oh, I hate my sin now when I do sin. Oh, my goodness. Oh. All right. How is it that one can be saved? Now, again, this is basic knowledge at the beginning of the presentation, but it gets a little bit more technical. Acts 4, 10 through 12 says, let, us, let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is, sal and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to my father except through me, he said in John 14, 6. Now we're going to talk about synergism and monergism. These are important doctrines. Um, two years ago, first coming to Tennessee, I was in a Sunday school. And believe me, I, 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 there's still a lot of vocabulary words I don't know. Uh, still a lot of vocabulary words that this little pea, pea brain here does not know. Um, but this is, uh, according to the website of this church I visited two years ago, our first month in Tennessee, uh, this church should have known these important words, these important doctrines and, and practices. Uh, the website looked like they were orthodox, the practice of right teaching, right thinking, right theology. But there was a lack of orthopraxy. There was a lack of practicing the orthodoxy. And we were in Sunday school, and one of the uh, uh, oh, the Sunday school teacher rightfully rightfully warned us that there's a lot of false converts in the churches today across America, and it was a very true statement. And I kind of mumble as a brand new visiting guest. I kind of mumbled, "Yeah, that's that's synergism for you." And to my surprise, the Sunday school teacher or no other men in the, other Christians in this Sunday school class uh, had a response to what synergism was. Um, um, and he, he asked me, can I, can you explain to me what, what, what is synergism? He said, I've never heard that word before. I mean, a very humble man in, in, indeed. And I says, well, it's, it's the opposite of monergism. Both are important words to understand, but I, I think that one of the other leaders, uh, a leader of your church, or perhaps the pastor was in there. He should explain it to, to you since I'm a new guest. And the pastor did. He, he actually was the only one that said he knew what the word meant. And he gave, um, he gave a uh, a quick, uh, what's it called? Oh, man, I keep forgetting that word. When you're put on the spot, um, impromptu. He gave a quick impromptu definition of synergism and monergism, and it was perfectly polished. It was absolutely a perfect, I don't think I could have given a, um, um, 
an impromptu response that quick, Johnny on the spot. I, I, I am not gifted in that area. I really don't like to be put on the spot. Um, but it was that it was a it was a providential thing that the Lord did where the pastor was put on the spot by a guest. And I don't think he liked me too much, uh, to be honest. Well, actually, I know he didn't like me very too much. Um, don't mean to get on a rabbit trail here, but instead of being seen as reinforcement at that church, I was seen as a threat. Very, very clear. And I'm glad to be part of a church now where um, where uh, I'm seen as reinforcement, not as a threat. Uh, it's hard to find a church where, where, where you should be at by God's will. But uh, enough of that. But that was an uh, interesting experience. And um, that, that this, these words were not taught in this church. And words do matter. Theology matters. Dogmatic theology matters. We're going to make dogmatic theology, dogmatism great again in this, in this presentation. And uh, all of those things matter very, very much. Synergism is sin. Sin, er, jism. Just remember, it is the bad guy. Monogism is the good guy. There are no good people. The monogism is the good word. Synergism is the bad four-lettered F word. The, four, the four-lettered S word, if you will. Synergism sinfully teaches that man has something to do with their salvation. Excuse me, break time. Thank you, ladies, for, for being quiet back there. Synergism teaches that if the lost walks forward, this is many unbiblical soteriologies. Synergism teaches that if the, if the, if the, if the lost walks forward or raises their hand in church, makes a decision for Christ or makes a decision for Jesus, invites Jesus into their heart, or repeats a prayer, or accepts Jesus, chooses salvation, uh, then that they are somehow saved uh, and now have faith. Synergism is not only unbiblical, it is anti-biblical. It is contra scriptura. And frankly, it is absolutely blasphemy. Uh, to claim that I ha have something to do with my salvation is to deify myself. It's to make a false deity of me, myself, and I. I have now lifted myself up and made a God out of myself to say I'm somehow just as powerful or important or equal to the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, because it's all about me, myself, and I. And I did some of these things, allegedly, which, by the way, I did. I repeated that sinner's prayer, and I walked forward at the unbiblical altar call many, many years ago. And as you know, in my testimony, I was a false convert for uh, four and a half, five years, and uh, it doesn't work. All it does is lead people to hell thinking they were saved when they weren't. It just creates false converts. Uh, but, yes, it is blasphemy. It's blaspheming the name of the Lord to 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 to. You dishonor him. It's it's uh, you know in the military has what's called stolen valor or stolen honor. Uh, this is stolen honor, stolen valor, stolen glory. Uh, when you rob God of the glory that He alone deserves, and as I've said before, synergism is a bunch of hocus pocus hogwash. I can't stand it. I hate it. But only by the grace of God did He save this wretch from that type of theology, that type of bad theology. Now, monergism, the good guy, the good word. Monergism comes from the Greek word that means to work alone, to work alone. That's monergism, to be monergistic. The Godhead is monergistic, and the three distinct persons of the Trinity work alone in concert with each other. Uh, each distinct person has a different role, but they're working alone. Three and one, the Trinity, the triunity of the Godhead. Monotheism teaches that salvation comes from God alone, and man has nothing to do with his salvation. Nothing to do with his or her salvation. Monotheism teaches, the Bible teaches. Imagine that. The Father, that the Father chooses his elect. It's called effectual calling, draws them to his son for his redemptive work on that cross. And his Holy Spirit regenerates the heart. God changes our heart and gives us new desires in our heart before 
we can believe. It's important to understand that regeneration comes before faith, and we're going to talk about that when we get into ordo salutis. That is so important to understand that. Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that last day. John 6, 33 says, and it is the Spirit who gives, the Spirit who gives, the third person of the Trinity who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Amen, amen. Ezekiel 37, 14, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This reminds me, you can add many other unbiblical soteriologies to that list that I had in previous slides, in a previous slide, a big paragraph of unbiblical forms of alleged salvation. Uh, you can add this one into that list that people say that I, I found God. No, God was not lost. We are lost and we need to be found. Or another one is, um, I made Jesus my Lord. I, I made him my Lord. No, let me tell you something. If you're in hell, in hell for an eternity, you are going to bow your knee and confess with your tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord, whether if you're saved or not, Jesus is always Lord. And if you claim to be a Christian, he's either your Lord of all, or he's not your Lord at all. John 6.65 says, this is why the Lord, this is why I told you that no one comes to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Jesus, pretty powerful. He's the God man. He's God with skin on, and he says, nobody, no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Working in concert with each other, three and one, the monogistic work of the triune Godhead. Now we're going to get into Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation. The Latin phrase Ordo Salutis means the Latin uh, the order of salvation. It's also is called the golden chain of redemption or the golden chain of regeneration, how we become saved. Now, there, there's some, I didn't make this chart. I, I stole it from the internet. Don't tell anybody. And then when I stretched it out to fit the slide, it just kind of lost its high definition. But this is not my graphic. Somebody else made it. There's wiggle room. There's, gr there's a gray, shady, blurry area between some of these uh, links in the chain of redemption, if you will, uh, or the order of salvation. Uh, but and, and much grace to those who, who don't agree with the way I present it. But I will say this. This is essential. I, I'm going to be dogmatic right here that regeneration comes before conversion. And the reason why I'm going to say that, that I'm very dogmatic on this, is because that's what synergisms, synergists do. They claim that I did this or I did that, uh, and that's why I'm saved. That I, I acquired faith or I put my faith in the Lord, and that's why I'm converted. No, no, no. Conversion comes before um, excuse me. Oh, oh boy, regeneration, the new birth, comes before conversion. That's very important to understand. Um, nonetheless, let's go through this one step at a time. The doctrine of, in case you have election, calling, regeneration, 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 then conversion, then conversion, justification, adoption, sanctification, perseverance, and glorification. The doctrine of election, there's so many verses, so many verses that, that speak of this. Um, Ephesians 1, 3 through 4, it's just, this, this infographic chart has just one. So we're just going to do this one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that he should be holy and blameless before him. The next one is 
the doctrine of calling uh, is, is, is calling somewhere in that golden chain of redemption. Calling. There's the general call where the preacher or, or the Christian shares or preaches the glorious gospel and the word of God. And, and that's how they are saved because it says in Romans 1 16 that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And then there's the effectual calling. That's where that's where they are actually called as the elect. But this this call right here is Romans 10, 13 through 15, which says uh, this is a good passage to use to convince people that the church is called to go out into the streets, the highways and the hedges, the alleys, the gutters in front of nude bars, in front of vice locations, in front of abortuaries that want to slaughter the unborn. Uh, out in the seedy, dark places is where the church needs to be. Not just places where it's fun and friendly. But out in the hostile, unsafe, unpredictable work environments. Romans 10, 13 through 15. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And by the way, out of context, that's in the Romans Road to Salvation, which is a bad form of soteriology. It's uh, used in uh, Bill Bright's for spiritual laws gospel track if a person calls upon the name of the lord to be saved it's only because god effectually called them it's only because god regenerated them it's because of the doctrine of regeneration the regeneration comes before conversion so if a person calls upon the name of the lord to be saved it's because the lord saved them it's monergistic it is not synergism another way of describing monergism versus synergism is Monergism is the work of the Lord alone. His salvation works, the, 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 the co cooperation of the three persons of the Trinity alone saves the lost, where synergism sinfully teaches that, that they somehow are saved because they co cooperate. They co uh, cooperate with, with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or all three in one. And the only reason why a person calls upon the name of the Lord is because the Lord alone saved them in the first place for everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed and how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard and how are they to hear without someone preaching and how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news you want to have dr shoal's remedy for Good feet, beautiful feet. Preach men, preach the gospel. We're all commanded to share the gospel and evangelize. But men, some men are called to preach out in the streets. The next one in ordo salutis, and this is where I'm going to be very dogmatic. This comes before the rest. Regeneration comes first. Let's make dogmatic theology great again. Regeneration is also known as the rebirth, being born again. Regeneration precedes faith. Regeneration comes before faith. Synergists don't believe that. They believe that their faith became a part of their salvation, or their faith in, in him is why they got saved. That, that is unbiblical hogwash regeneration is the rebirth and the regenerate heart comes before faith as one pastor said the chicken comes before the egg even if you buy your eggs in the store that's one of the things i love about our church and it's really not an important reason to love your church but one of the less important reasons why I love our church, I love our church most for more important reasons, but one of the lesser important things is you, uh, yesterday I walked into church and on the pew was carton, empty carton of eggs over here. And this pew over here, there was full cartons of eggs over there. And of course I brought a full carton of egg for a family and, and we, we love on each other and lavish on each other by sharing our breads, home baked breads, uh, even, even smoked meats, um, Sometimes we have an overabundance of eggs, so we're bringing our eggs in. But even if you went to the store and bought a dozen of eggs, the chicken, you may not see the chicken that was involved in the life of those eggs, giving life to those eggs and a new birth to those eggs. The chicken was involved. The chicken came before the egg. 
I don't have any 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 formal training in chickenology, the study of chickenry, uh, but I know for a fact that the chicken comes before the egg. Regeneration precedes faith. You have got to understand that because my faith did not save me. Regeneration, the Lord monergistically saved me. And I simply responded in repentance and faith once that regeneration occurred first. I would ask yourself, what are some evidences of regeneration? Well, uh, I, I think I think it was Vodivakum that said, um, you will learn to hate the things that God hates and love the things that God loves. When God regenerates that heart, the regenerate heart, you will have a holy hatred for your own sin and because he saved you if he saved you he granted you repentance even the repentance is not a horizontal uh, it's first this there's a salvific repentance uh, a repentance that he gave us when his monergistic salvation came into our, our our regenerate heart he grants repentance to his elect and 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 we will continually hate our sins we will continually repent uh, we will hate the things that God hates. We will not have a false, sensual, worldly love for sinful lifestyles. Quiet. Quiet. Come here. That's that little part. Dwight Mark is telling me that she's got to go P O T T Y. All right. So um, the Lord, uh, where were we? Yeah, you, you have a holy hatred for sin. And you will love the things that God loves. You will not tolerate, acquiesce to, uh, celebrate, participate in other sins. Uh, you will not be going to a gay wedding uh, if there was such a thing, uh, because it is a sin to tolerate, acquiesce, celebrate, or participate in that. Anything that is blasphemy, you're going to hate those things because God hates them too. And that's one of the evidences of a regenerate heart. Uh, I, I love um, how Vodi described that. All right, next, before salvation, we were dead. We were dead. As the scripture says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. This dead word is the Greek word necros. It's where we get the word necromancer from, a person who talks to the dead. It's it's going on to the dark side. It's another sin that God hates, necromancers, fortune tellers, palm readers, uh, those type of people, by the way, I, I, I used to go and preach inside those places until I got kicked out and preached on the outside until they called the police and got moved along, etc. Got a couple of videos on the Internet doing that. But but dead is dead. Uh, the definition of this cross is a person who is spiritually, physically and metaphorically dead, unable to come out of the grave, unable to come to a faith, unable to believe, unable to raise your hand, unable to accept Jesus, unable to uh, raise your hand and, and, and or repeat this prayer, absolutely dead. You can't get any more dead than dead. And it says in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, um, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the heart and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. My natural nature used to be a child of wrath, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, the us is the elect, which God loved his church, those that are saved, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And by grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Praise be to God for his glorious word. Continuing, for by grace, this is verse 9 of Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not, of, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
for we are a workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We cannot boast in our works. My baptism did not save me. My beliefism did not save me. My faith did not save me. My repentance did not save me. All of those things came because the chicken came before the egg. God regenerated me uh, and, 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 and changed my heart, gave me a new birth, and then I was converted and had faith. That's how the Ordo of Salutis works. That's how salvation works. You know, man, uh, I met a Christian here, a professing Christian here in Tennessee, sharing the gospel with him. And you know what he said to me? Man, I, I'm in my 60s now, and I've never heard one respond in this way. He said, I'm a Christian. I'm proud of, of, of how I've changed. I'm proud of what I became. My goodness. He actually said, I'm proud of myself. I am proud that I no longer do this. I asked him to explain, what do you mean you're proud? I mean, I'm proud of God. That's still, I, I'm not even proud of my grandchildren. Uh, my, my pride is it should be in him. If I have pride, it's a terrible thing. I'm proud of me. He, he said he's proud of himself. And, you know, man, uh, if he was a Christian at our church, I would love on him more and try to maybe, Lord willing, he can change his words, change his language. But to say I'm proud of what I've become it is so prideful and so haughty. Um, and, and, uh, no, we, we cannot boast in anything that we've accomplished or anything we we've done. Our boasting must be him and him alone. Monergism, monergists will boast in the Lord because they know it was only the Lord and synergists boast in themselves and they take credit or in some cases they'll take some credit in themselves. I hate synergism. I hate it. I, I, again, hate what God hates and love what God loves. John 3, 3 through 8 says, speaking of the rebirth or regeneration, and Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, surely, surely, <laughs> that was another translation, truly, how about verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you. <laughs> I, I still have other translations stuck in my, my brain. Um, truly, truly, I'm actually using ESV in this presentation, I believe. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I oh, marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound. You do not know where it comes from or from where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The next step. No, it's not a 10-step program. But the next link in the golden chain of redemption is conversion. James 1.18. Mm -hmm. Of his own will, he brought forth. By the way, she makes funny noises. Hear that? Hear that breathing? She has a weirding. Call me before you send the text. Of his own will. I'm just reading a text on my phone there. Sorry about the distractions, but this is an informal presentation. Of his own will, and he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Again, we are a bond slave to, bond, to sin, and then we become a slave to God, a slave to Christ. We were we 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 should be a first a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We become Christians now, uh, learners and disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ, and the standard is his scripture. Uh, Acts three nineteen says, "Repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out." Now, if a person does truly repent and turn back. It's because of the monogistic work of the of salvation. Yes, in evangelism, we'll tell them God commands all men everywhere to repent and to repent so that your sins may be blotted out. Or as Jesus said in Mark 1, 15, repent and believe in the gospel. But if they did that, it was, and if they truly did that in a salvific sense, it was because the Lord converted. The, the Lord regenerated their heart first 
and cause them to repent and believe. Matthew 18, 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. You must become a baby, a newborn creature in Christ. Yeah. And then as we grow in Christ, Lord willing, his Holy Spirit sanctifies you. And you get off the, the bottle and you get off the milk. And now you get into the meat and potatoes and start digging into theology and doctrine and the word of God. Next is justification. This is a legal term with forensic value. Uh, where Christ declares the, the, the lost, the, but that has been now found, the new elect, Christ declares them righteous before the Father. Uh, the imputation of Christ, all kinds of things happen on the cross where they are now imputed with Christ's righteousness and his holiness. Justification, Romans 5, 1 through 10. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Continuing. Verse 6, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely, uh, uh, that's the ungodly, is the elect. That's a person who, who, who knows they are ungodly, a person that knows they're broken. God, God, because God regenerates their heart and made him realize, man, I, I'm, I'm really unworthy. I'm ungodly. I'm a sinner. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person through perhaps though perhaps a, for a good person whom would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, the elect. He died for the elect. That's the us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now we, that we have reconciled, that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Praise be to God. The next one in the chain of redemption is adoption. As I've said many times before, I don't think there's a standing president of the United States in my adult life that I remember listening to you know, every term where they never, where they did not say, um, that we are all children of God. You're all God's children. Every president says that. I don't understand it. And there was one atheist president in my lifetime. Maybe he, maybe he did not say that. But all the other ones, they would all say, we're all children of God. And that is unbiblical. The only way, the script, when the scripture refers to the children of God, it's speaking of the elect. And the only way you can become a child of God, a children of God, of God's children is by being adopted into his family. It's, it's part of the order of salvation. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Only the elect has the true right to call Father, Abba, Father. Next is sanctification. Uh, we can go real long on this, but I'm just going to go very brief and do a, a scratch the surface uh, view of sanctification. First Thessalonians 5, uh, uh, 23 through 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. I talked much more about this at church and sanctification, but I'm going to keep it brief 
for the purposes of this presentation, but uh, when he when he saves us, he sanctifies us, makes us holy, uh, uh, separates us from the word from the world. Uh, we are now set apart. We are different. Uh, we're not better than them, but we small certainly are better off in God in Christ. And uh, you show me a professing Christian that doesn't show sanctification, it doesn't show any repentance, and I'll show you what you most likely have a false convert. Moving on to perseverance, 1 John 2.19, also known as the, the fifth uh, the fifth point of Calvinism, or the, the P and the Ackerman Tulip, or the doctrine of the perseverance of saints. I sure hope you guys, I, if I let her down, she'll pee on the carpet behind me, and I don't want to stop this and do it all over. I don't even know how to pause the PowerPoint presentation when you're videotaping it, so I got to really press on, but I hope you don't hear her breathing. She breathes very funny. I've had her looked at, by the way, and she's okay, right? Right, sweetie? Uh, perseverance. Uh, I noticed on the on the website on the internet two days ago when I when I log on, it's neat because I get a, a, all the news flashes, thumbnails for you know stories, and and it, and it knows what I'm looking at. So so it it you know that artificial intelligence, uh, and so um uh. Yeah, there's one article I saw, why Americans are leaving their churches. You see these every year, these articles keep reserving. And and instead of being called converts, uh, these people that are leaving their churches are called non-verts. Not a convert, but a non-vert. And then there's another article called Losing My Religion, Who Walks Away From Their Faith. Uh, here's one. I've seen ten the 10 reasons why people leave their faith or lose their faith or leave the church. Uh, but here's uh, 25 grim reasons behind the exodus of American Christians from Christianity. I didn't read these three articles. I already know the answer. It's synergism, which creates false converts. It's synergism. I hate it. We got to have a holy hatred for sin -er These people believe they had something to do with their salvation. Uh, it could be youth at a youth con conference, which is unbiblical. It could be men at a men's conference, which is biblical. It could be a group of women at a women's conference, which is unbiblical. I, I think we need to get away from all of these conferences and just have solid local churches. And they hear a synergistic form of alleged salvation, and they walk forward at the altar call, or they slip their hand, or they repeat that prayer, or they invite Jesus into their heart, or they accept him. And, and and then they're told that they're saved, which is absolute blasphemy, because no man is omniscient. No man can know that you are saved for sure. And then they walk away from the church 20 years later when they're an adult. They walk away from their faith. They did not lose their salvation. In Reformed theology, we believe in the doctrine of the perseverance of saints. And... If we believe salvation is of God alone, monergistic, that means that God will persevere and keep our salvation monergistically all the way to the end. And these people left the church. I'm not talking about leaving your local church to go to another church. That might be a good thing because the Lord might be using your gifts at another church. I'm talking about those who leave the faith or leave the universal church, period. They give up. On their on their so-called salvation, if you will, the reason why is because they were not saved from the very beginning. They were never saved. They were either a wolf in sheep's clothing or they were a false convert. And it says right here in First John two nineteen. This is why they walked away from their alleged faith. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all were not of us. They were never a Christian. They were only a Sino, a Christian in name only. That is what oftentimes I use the language professing Christian on social media. Professing is a difference between a Christian and a professing Christian. A professing Christian professes with their lips that they are an alleged Christian, but there's no possession of regeneration in the heart. Again, the chicken comes before the egg. There must be a regenerate heart. The doctrine of regeneration is extremely 
essential to understand how that works. Now there are wolves in sheep's clothing, and then there are false converts. A wolf is also is obviously an intentional wolf who is dressed and acting like a Christian to blend in and devour brothers and sisters. They are an enemy and must be guarded against, although we won't always know who they are immediately. And then there are false converts. The wolves are always suspects. Uh, the false converts are, though they're also wretched sinners, uh, but they're, some of them are what I call victims. Victims of what? They're, they've been victimized of unbiblical soteriologies, victimized and being told that they were a Christian because they did this or did that. They put the egg before the chicken. They didn't put the chicken before the egg. They believe that they have faith because they did this or they did that. And that is why we've got to hate synergism and understand the order of salvation and a biblical soteriology. Synergism is the major cause of false converts. Last but not least, glorification. Oh, the doctrine of glorification. Some of you are going to experience this doctrine sooner than me, and I'll be experiencing this sooner than some of y'all. And that's where we die and we go into glory. We go to be in glory with the Lord, where he he, he, he receives us, and eventually after he raises the dead, both the living and the dead, he, he gives the, the, the elect a new body, and they are glorified in heaven with him, where they will spend their life in eternity, in glory, with the Lord in heaven. Romans 8, 28 through 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Again, this is for Christians only, those that are regenerate. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There's the general calling to go out and tell, to go and tell and preach and share the glorious gospel. Then he effectually calls them, he saves them, and he foreknew that, and he predestined the elect to be saved before the foundations of the world. And he also foreknew and predestined those whom he would not save as well. And then he conforms them to Christ, he changes them, the elect is declared righteous before the Father, and then after living a life of holiness in God, in Christ, they are they pass away and they are glorified to be with the Lord. That is the end of this presentation. Now next, my next one will be, the pastor gave me this assignment, our, one of our two pastors. He assigned me the doctrine of the doctrine of demons, also known as demonology, the study of demons. So I'm gonna go on the dark side for the next presentation. So please give me wisdom as I carefully and prayerfully uh, put that. I got to study. It's uh, hours and actually a whole day of study minimally, and then probably into the second day of studying and then putting it all together. So by the grace of God, for the glory of God. Until we see you again, Lord willing, Semper Referamunda. Right, Emily? All right, let's go potty. Got to go potty? All right, let's go.